again, since you weren't here and, I'm, and you came in a little bit later, we really haven't, in this whole group, we haven't gone over um, the metaphysics in the sense of this, this chart here. Does everybody have one of these? Again, the belief is, you know, to tell to the, the little story, most everybody's heard of the Adam and Eve story, you know, and the, the fall from grace and the feeding of the tree, the fruit of the good and evil, and all the good and evil, and this and that. In the chorus, it's kind of described as um, into eternity, where all is one, <laughs> there crept a tiny, mad idea at which the Son of God remembered not to laugh. You can imagine a very powerful mind that was created as the Son of God and this puff of an idea. And you could, if you give, gave a word to it, you could call it the ego. It's kind of analogous to the, uh, in the Garden of Eden story, you know, the snake was the tempter. It's kind of called Adam and Eve, you know, to come away, listen to me instead of God. The puff, you could say, is kind of like, what if there could be more than everything? I mean, the paradise, the Garden of Eden, or this eternity where all is one, is literally heaven. And the puff was kind of saying, you know, what if there could be more than everything? Or, gee, <coughs> you're the son. Your father created you. Why settle for number two? Why not usurp? Why not be number one? You know, you can give a different wording, but that's pretty much what this puff is saying. Why not come apart and have your own kingdom where you can be number one? You don't have to answer to anybody. You aren't the created. You are now the creator. You're the maker. And so the mind seemed to, for an instant, for just one instant, seemed to, instead of laughing at the idea, went, hmm, kind of like, I wonder if. And, and giving such a powerful mind and even focusing it on such a, a teeny puff, was kind of analogous to the Big Bang, you know, how the scientists, <laughs> <laughs> they, there was a big explosion somehow, and, and matter and heat and lava or whatever was, right. was, was, was hurled away. Well, that's not even what the Big Bang was. It was this, yeah. giving this power to this incredible belief. It was uh, seeming a cleavage of the mind, but the mind suddenly, this mind of lightness seemed to be in darkness, you know seemed to have bought the puff or listened to the snake and it seemed to be in darkness now. And the puff was the belief that you could separate from God. And the, immediately the puff turned to the mind and said, you've done it now. You have ripped yourself apart from God and from heaven. And God is very angry for what you've done. You've stolen. You've, you've done something terribly <coughs> wrong here. And the mind listened to the puff and the pup kind of said, you know, in the Garden of Eden story, it was Adam and Eve, you know, they, they, they were naked, and they covered themselves, kind of. In this version, it's kind of like the world of time and space and form was made up as like this giant screen or this giant smoke screen or hiding place. And the pup kind of said, you know, God can't chase you into form, into specifics and fragments. God is whole and complete and one. And he's not going to come looking for you in the dust, so to speak, in all this fragmentation and separation. So if you go and hide and, and hide in the world, you know, here we make world, universe, there's a body, you know, so on and so forth. You can hide in specifics because God is abstract and one and whole. And so the puff or the mind listened to the puff and moved away from all of this light and moved towards the darkness. Here's the, here's the seeming puff being taken seriously, and here's the, the darkness over here is the ego, or the, the puff of the tempter. And the mind moved out away from the split and moved out here and identified out here where it says behavior projection. Right out here at the very edge is the, is the cosmos, is the world. So the mind became identified with a body. A mind no longer. It, it had forgotten that it was this vast mind and it was identified with the body. And it forgot, you know, the ego said, forget about this battle. It kept saying, God's going to get you and there's this eternal war that will go on now. And, and the ego said, just forget about this. You've done it, you know, you've done it, just forget about it now. Go out here in the world and forget about it. 
And out here in the world is where the split seems to take place because the mind becomes identified with the body, which is, you could call it the subject. This is, you know, there's, what was the show on TV where they, they said, uh, this, was, this is your life? You know, where they, they would bring all these people, teachers and friends, and this is your life because that person who was on stage is, is kind of like the subject. That, the person is the subject of the life and all of the people that seem to come across that person's path. Those are all the objects. All those teachers and all those environments that, they, that this person seems to live in. But that's all the object. So out here, you've got a subject-object split. And you see right away there's the duality. The mind has forgotten the oneness of everything and believes that it's a tiny little subject in the, in the world, in an objective world. And it goes through life and it battles. It seems like this little subject has to do a lot just to keep its head above water. It has to survive. It seems to be in conflict right off the bat with parents. You know, the terrible twos in the sense of the other way. It's, it's wanting to, the subject's wanting to assert its autonomy and its will. And there's these rules. Like mom and dad have rules. And I'm teeny. <laughs> and I've got to live by these rules. <laughs> and it's trying to assert its autonomy. And it's, it's always in friction, sometimes with parents, sometimes with siblings. And it grows older. Who'd you get for your third grade teacher? You got this and says, oh, it's terrible. She's the worst teacher in the school, you know. Once again, friction sometimes with teachers, sometimes with ministers. Then it grows older. Sometimes it, it, it gets jobs. It has frictions with coworkers or with bosses who tell it to do things. It seem to have <laughs> that's it. You see, as it, life goes on and on, it always it has moments where it seems like there's a harmony. And there seems like there's a connectedness with other persons. And it even seems like there's some special persons. This, uh, out here on the screen, it's always, the subject is always trying to solve its problem out here on the screen. <coughs> it's kind of like it grows up and it says, well, I'm young and I'm single, and if I just had a girlfriend, life would be a lot better. Or if I had a boyfriend, you know, it's looking for something right away to make itself better. Or if I just had a job, I wouldn't have to, to constantly just take money from my parents and I could do more things on my own and, you know, more autonomy. If I had a, had a job, if I moved to a better place, like, oh, I don't like living in rural Louisiana. I want to go out to New York City and, or California, hit the big time. And again, it's still seen as a, if I change something out here on the screen, I can make a better life for this subject. And what the teachings of all the perennial wisdom and all the spiritual teachings teach that it, it's a ma mistaken perception. And as long as the mind is believing in the ego, as long as it's still paying attention to the tempter, as long as there's still this fear-based thought system in the mind, it doesn't matter what it does in the world. It can seek to the end of the world to find peace and happiness but it won't find peace and happiness until it begins to question the beliefs, which are kind of like the stilts that are the underpinnings of the world. Like if this is the world on top and, and the beliefs and the thoughts are underneath it, you can see that the world's going to still seem to be mm -hmm. the world until you question the beliefs. And the world dissolves. <coughs> so that's, that gives us a little bit of a basis for everything we go into. And to bring it back to the situation you're bringing up, part of the belief system of the ego is that the mind is not a mind any longer, but it's, it's a body. Mm -hmm. And that our brothers aren't really minds or spirits either. They're body, they're flesh, instead of mind or spirit. And so the concern for bodies is really just an expression out here of the belief that I have separated from God and I've taken on this made-up identity that's fictitious, and the mind knows, it, it tried to forget all of this, but deep down, it, it knows what's going on. So it, it, in a sense, whenever we seem to get upset with someone or something, everything's just playing itself out in divine order, so to speak. You know, all things work together for good, like the Bible says, but the mind is so afraid of knowledge, and it's made 
judgment about this dream that it seems to be a threat. Whenever this, whenever this light approaches the mind, it's, it's afraid of the Holy Spirit, and it, instead of seeing that it's, it's afraid of the Holy Spirit or it has an issue with God, it seems like, no, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of God. I'm afraid of God. I might starve to death, or my daughter might, you know, her car might break down in the mountains, and, and she might be, you know, it's, her safety might be threatened or whatever. Everything that seems like a problem is always projection of this original error. So. so it's a non-problem, really, <laughs> right? When you get down to the bottom line. Well, until I feel, it's, until I feel at peace about it, as long as I'm feeling, as long as there's any charge at all about it, then yes, there's still more that has to be looked at in that. Not out here. Not <coughs> about what she should or shouldn't do, or what I should or shouldn't do, but just. I, I'm still apparently not seeing this, perceiving this correctly because I still feel uneasy or something. Cool. There's more to look at. <coughs> than that. Yeah, there's, the there's another part. belief that has to be questioned. <coughs> but in questioning that, how can I say it? You won't see the truth without the help of the Holy Spirit. You, you can't do without enlisting that aid. Right, right. And that's what I'm saying. That's the missing element. Is not what we need to do on the screen, but how we need the Holy Spirit to help us to to see it differently. And that's where oh, the right. miracles are. You can't do it without the Holy yeah. Spirit. It's the same point with the ego. But see, we when we talk, we're talking like I go inside and I change something inside me and change the way I think, and then it comes out different on the screen. And it's still that I that's doing that we get confused and when it's really not an I but a Holy Spirit I guess <laughs> I don't know how to explain it but you know what I'm saying because when I try to do it I'm still in the world of the ego but when I'm doing it in concert with the will of God and the Holy Spirit then that's a whole different that's the only person or whatever and that's the only way I will get clear, and that's yeah. the only way I will not feel <coughs> uneasy or upset about whatever has ever happened. Because yeah. then, it's once my perception has changed, it's not dependent on what happens yeah. out here. You know, events can be one way or another, but my perception will be clear. It will be without yeah. fear. I think the important, it's important to note, too, is to go into a little bit about this questioning thing, because the whole thing of questioning your belief, I mean, the ego is not so keen on this. Not so I mean, in other words, it's the belief, <laughs> part of the ego. To question one's beliefs is to question the ego, yeah. is to start to question. And again, I could use some metaphors to give you an idea of this. Really, you are questioning the Holy Spirit when you're questioning your belief system. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a way that you could question with the ego, but we need to get into the, the difference between questioning with the ego versus questioning with the Holy Spirit, which I see is what Ron wants to take it in. The ego wants to, first of all, it's happy if you don't question at all. Happiest. Happiest. <laughs> yeah. If you just kind of like say, life's miserable, I can't do anything about it, I'm powerless, I'm helpless, all I can do is try to partake in the, some of the pleasures of the world and kind of use a band-aid approach and kind of distract, distract from it or you know, just say, admit that I can't do anything about it and just try to handle it with some kind of an arrangement with the world, some old drugs, some alcohol, some going to an amusement park or anything just to forget the thought. Then there's the questioning of, of the screen, which is, is really the ego study itself in the sense of all the disciplines and everything that breaks it down when you study um, biology and you study um, chemistry and you study you know, take your pick of all the things that, all the learnings of the world, when it, really you're studying the parts, how all the parts, first of all, you got to label all the parts. Big job. So, you, you have, you pick a specialty or whatever, and you label all the parts, then you got to, not only that, but you got to figure out and, and name and, and question how do all the parts work together. 